Hello, everyone. Uh, we're moving on to Chapter 6 here in this segment. Uh, chapter 6 in the Introduction to Networks course, which, as you can see, is going to deal with the data link layer. Uh, remember, in the OSI model, this would be layer 2. Uh, we stated early on that the two primary functions of that layer were framing, uh, which is preparing the data in the proper format for the type of network media that's going to be used, and then secondly, error detection. Uh, I want to emphasize the word detection and not correction. So it can detect frame-based errors, uh, but it'll simply drop the frame. And then retransmission would typically be done at either the transport layer with TCP or at within the application itself. So we're going to do this chapter in two segments. Uh, we'll do half of it in this segment and half in the next. So we're going to deal with uh, a little bit more detail into the function and purpose of the data link layer. We're going to look at some uh, media access control methods, as well as some topologies used in WANs and LANs. And then also we're going to look at the characteristics and functions of the data link frame. So as we said, our two primary purposes, framing and error detection. Uh, some other things to look at here. Uh, primarily, the data link layer is responsible for the network interface card. So the operations there involved with, if we look at our diagram, uh, when a device receives or sends uh, bits on the media, this is basically going to be the layer that every device will have to read uh, to, to basically determine if we're on a local network, if the destination MAC address in the frame is belonging to that device. Now, once that device determines that that MAC is not its own, it would then drop the frame. And only the device whose MAC matches the destination would continue to decapsulate the frame and process it. So essentially, it's going to encapsulate, decapsulate, uh, well, encapsulate IP packets. Because when we send, of course, we're moving this way. So we're going to be receiving IP packets from the network layer, and it's going to encapsulate that into the data link frame. Um, so the point they make here is the upper layers, three through seven, really don't get involved at all in uh, the physical media. That's going to be primarily the job of the data link layer itself. Uh, media access control, which is how data is placed and received on the media. Uh, we talked about encapsulation, and then the last part is going to be error detection. Okay, so real briefly, I know this is getting a little bit ahead of the chapter, but I wanted to pull over a standard Ethernet 2 frame. Uh, simplified version, but notice we have our destination MAC field followed by our source MAC field. This is going to identify what type of IP packet it is. Um, and then we're going to have our variable data. And then lastly, in the trailer of the frame, we're going to have the cyclic redundancy check or checksum. This is basically going to be a hash code that's calculated before sending the frame. And then it's going to be checked again at the receiving end. And if these checksums don't match, it's going to determine that that frame is corrupted and it would then be dropped. So there's your error detection part of that. And while I have this up, I also wanted to briefly show you how that relates uh, to a wireless frame. So I know a couple times we've mentioned how much more overhead there is in wireless communication. Well, you can just see from the frame structure itself, and there are different types of wireless frames, this would be a data frame moving from a device to the access point. But just in the sheer fields that you see here, uh, there's a lot more control fields. There's a lot more communication that has to take place. So you're going to see a lot more overhead in that case. So essentially, um, as far as the MAC addressing goes, we know that that only applies on a local network. 
that any time the host communicates outside the LAN, uh, the router is basically just going to act as a proxy and utilize its MAC address as the destination. And then as it moves beyond the router, uh, if that type of media requires MAC addresses, because keep in mind, MAC addresses are specific to Ethernet. So if it's wired Ethernet or wireless, then MAC addressing would still apply. But then that MAC addressing in the outbound frame is going to change. So it's going to substitute its exit interface MAC as the source. And then the next device's inbound interface MAC would be the destination. So the MAC address is changing at each point if the MAC address applies. Okay. Uh, as far as 802 and how that interacts here with the data link layer, uh, some new information here is that 802 subdivides the data link layer of the OSI model into two separate sublayers that you see here. So the lower of the two that is closer to the physical layer would be called the MAC sublayer, media access control. And then the upper layer, which is closer to the network layer, is called the logical link control. So this is going to be responsible for upward communication and downward from the upper layers. The max sublayer is going to be more uh, focused on communicating to the physical layer. So you do need to be aware of the two IEEE standards in play here. Uh, the logical link control sublayer is standard IEEE 802.2. The MAC sublayer is going to depend upon what type of technology we're talking. So for standard wired Ethernet, it's 802.3. And for wireless LANs, we know it's going to be a version of 802.11. Okay, 802.15 for Bluetooth. So those are two sublayers. You need to be aware of those, what their general functions are, and essentially what the IEEE standards are that go with those. Uh, so specifically, the LLC, logical link, will take the network protocol data, which we know is going to be IP addressing, and then adds the layer to frame information, which is going to be used to basically communicate directly with the physical layer. Uh, the MAC sublayer, the lower of the two, frame delimiting, so essentially, that means that it's going to have some signals within the frame that are going to tell the receiving device that this is the start of the frame, this is the end of the frame, that sort of thing. We already saw how the addressing is added in. And then in that trailer with the cyclic redundancy check, the CRC, the error detection. Okay. So as far as providing access to the media, at each hop or each device, a router, because we tend to think of a router as only uh, performing layer three functions with routing. But if you think about it, a router has to receive uh, bits at layer one, has to decapsulate or encapsulate the frame for the, for the uh, physical connection. So for example, we got a wired ethernet here. That's going to come in. The router is going to have to decapsulate that, look at the MAC addressing first. Then it would look at the IP. If that particular information is supposed to be sent out, then it has to obviously first determine the routing information based on the destination IP, determine what interface it needs to send it to. But then you'll notice this outbound interface is a serial connection. So this is going to have an entirely different frame format than the Ethernet connection. So it would re-encapsulate into this frame format, add the required fields, and then send it out. Same could be said if it were if it were wireless or fiber or whatever the case may be. Now we have a variety of standards that apply here at the data link layer. Uh, IEEE we just mentioned. You know, ITU, International Telecommunication Union, the ISO, and of course, ANSI. So let's check our understanding here, purpose of the data link layer. Another name for the OSI data link layer, of course, that would be layer two. 
Uh, the IEEE 802 LAN MAN data link layer consists of which two sublayers? It's going to be the logical link control or LLC, as well as the media access control sublayer or MAC. The responsibility of the MAC sublayer is basically going to be dealing with media access control. So providing the method to get the frame on and off the media. What layer two function does a router perform? Well, as we just said, it has to accept the frame from the medium. It'll have to decapsulate the frame and then re-encapsulate the frame into the proper frame type for the outbound interface. Now this, referring to its layer three routing table, that is not a layer two function. So although it will do that, that is a layer three function. The media access control method used depends on which two criteria. It's gonna depend upon the type of topology, which is gonna uh, take into account the devices that we're using, as well as if it's a shared media topology. So in the days when we use tubs, or even with a wireless access point, those are both shared media topologies, meaning that devices have to follow a very specific protocol to know when they can transmit. Which organization defines standards for network access layer, the OSI physical and data link layers? Um, of course, that's going to be the IEEE. Okay, so we got 100% on that. Great. Let's continue on to topologies. So we have talked about this in the past, uh, the difference between a physical and a logical topology. Essentially, the physical is going to be a drawing of how the key network devices, servers, etc., are physically connected. So that's basically going to be your wiring diagram. But that by itself is not the total picture. Because until we add the logical topology, which is essentially, you know, we see how things are physically connected here, but until we add the logical, which is going to include our IP addressing, uh, they're not shown here, but that would be things like VLANs, things that will affect how the data will flow across those physical devices, which can vary depending on. Um, essentially the data link layer and even the layer three configurations. So moving into WAN topologies, uh, point to point, very common. So, you know, essentially any business that makes a connection to an ISP, uh, this would be a point to point. All of our home internet connections would be point to point. Hub and spoke. So we've got a central device or location. And then we've got multiple uh, other locations that connect to that. So this could be like a central office, branch office type of thing. Um, and then of course, we get into a full mesh. Full mesh where everything is connected to every other site or device. Uh, we could also just have a partial mesh. So maybe this one is the most important site you know, everybody makes a connection to that. And then also maybe we have one redundant connection that would be called a partial mesh. And the other thing to keep in mind is in WANs, we can have not only physical point to points, but we can also have a logical point to point. So we can tell a provider, you know, we have a site in Cleveland, we have a site in say New York, and we need essentially those two sites connected directly, they would do that through their cloud. Uh, typically nowadays using either a technology called MPLS, which is multi-protocol label switching, or with the new software defined WAN systems, they could do this as well. So that would be a logical point to point. Um, and the same goes for these other topologies. We could do this logically. We could have a full mesh. So we could tell a provider, look, we need all uh, five of these sites interconnected. And they could do that significant, significantly cheaper through a logical topology. Uh, our basic review of our LAN topologies, 
So we know most networks are going to be some form of star where we have a central device in the middle like a switch and then our end devices are connecting to that. If we connect a switch to a switch, we're expanding that into an extended star. Uh, buses and rings really not used much anymore in lands. The first Ethernet systems were a bus topology, a physical bus. Uh, essentially where we had coaxial cable with T connectors and we literally just daisy chain between devices. So that would be a bus. Uh, ring, there was a system back in the 80s called a token ring system made by IBM. Used a special uh, device in the center here called a multi-station access unit or a MAU. And essentially when one device would transmit to the MAU, it would go into what's called a ring in port, and then it would go out the very next connected ring out port. And then it would go back and out, back and out, back and out. So essentially, if you look at the logical flow, it's moving from device to device. Even if this device needed to talk to this one, it wouldn't do so directly. It would have to go through each ring in, ring out port until it finally got to that ring out port. So this brings up a good point that our physical and our logical topologies could be different. So here's a case where we had a physical star because we have a central device and these are physically wired to it. But when you look at the way the data is logically flowing, it's flowing in a ring. So physical star, logical ring. Um, essentially, with a modern star with a switch, we have a physical star, but then you could say that we have a logical point to point through the ports or even a logical bus. Because if we just have the two devices on the bus, and don't forget we're operating in full duplex with a switch, uh, it could still be considered a bus logically. So half duplex, full duplex, we've been over that. Half duplex, we can transmit or receive, but not simultaneously. So hubs only allowed half duplex. Wireless access points also only allow half duplex. And then full duplex is going to be a switch. Uh, we're transmitting and receiving simultaneously. Uh, access control methods, this part is a little confusing, uh, typically because our modern wired Ethernet systems uh, no longer use this access protocol. But back in the days of hubs, uh, there was a protocol that Ethernet used called CSMACD. And you can see it's used on legacy bus topology Ethernet LANs. So either with hubs or with uh, the coaxial cable systems. But essentially what would happen, this is now a shared media and all the hosts are in contention with each other to use that media. So the first step of this was carrier sense. Essentially the, the host that wanted to send would check to see if there's already a signal on the media. If no signal is detected, then any station could transmit. So that's the multiple access part. No priority given. Uh, but the, the truth of the matter is, there could have been two or more stations checking step one at the same time. So this one's checking, there's no signal detected here because maybe the signal from this one is only here at that point. So what's gonna happen is somewhere on this media, or on the hub, there's going to be a collision. Okay, the frames are basically going to be destroyed, uh, and then they built in collision detection. So what would happen essentially is they would collide, the frames destroyed, the signal level would be higher than normal. Uh, they would do what's called a jam signal, which means that they keep transmitting for you know some odd microseconds so that every other station could sense that out at the 100 uh, meter limits of the media and that they wouldn't get into the mix. And then after the jam, they would stop 
and they called that a back off. And then after the back off period, they would go back to square one. So check the media again, multiple access. If it gets there, great. If not, collision detection, retry. So in the days of hubs, uh, on each port, you had a collision light, and those lights would just be flashing constantly. So end result, your throughput uh, through a device like a hub, you know, you're looking at maybe 40, 50% throughput. Okay. So that's on contention based systems. Now, wireless Ethernet still utilizes a variation of that. So it's still going to do a carrier sense, see if there's a signal already being transmitted, multiple access. Now, there is an added step here. The wireless device has to send RTS or ready to send to the AP. And then once the AP responds back with a clear to send, the device can begin transmission. And that's the collision avoidance part. So the RTS, CTS uh, allows collision avoidance. Uh, modern switch networks do not use the traditional Ethernet protocol. Uh, there's no need to because we're full duplex. Typically, we have one device per port. So there's no way possible we could have collisions. Uh, back in the day when we had token ring, that was called controlled access because basically each station is given a set amount of time. So they would receive a special electronic token and then that device would have so much time to send or uh, receive data. And if not, it would pass the token back to the MAU. The MAU would pass the token to the next station. So it was easier to determine you know, performance because these are uh, defined times that each station would have access to the network. Uh, end result, it was a very expensive system. It wasn't designed to scale very well. So Ethernet basically killed off uh, token ring. So this section is going to basically explain what I explained in the previous uh, graphics, how CSMACD works. Uh, CSMACA used in Wi-Fi. Uh, so let's check our understanding. Which topology displays networking device layer IP addresses? That's going to be our logical topology. What kind of network would use point-to-point, -point, hub and spoke, or mesh topologies? Typically, those are going to be WAN topologies. Which LAN topology is a hybrid? That would typically be your extended star because each section is a star, but they might have a point-to-point -point or a bus connection between the switches. Which duplex communication method is used in wireless LANs? As I said, that's going to be a half-duplex system. And which media access control method is used in legacy Ethernet LANs? So it's carrier sense, multiple access, collision detection. Let's give that a check. Yay, we got 100%. So with that, we're going to move on to the data link frame. And I'm going to stop this segment here. Uh, we'll pick up in the next section and finish off section 6.3 and 6.4. See you in the next segment.